welcome to the most wonderful real estate podcast ever, the show that gives you the lowdown on how to become a successful real estate entrepreneur with more than 30 years of experience. America's top female real estate investor one is an expert in financial freedom and turning dreams into realities. Now's your chance to become a Dwandonair with the help of Dwan. Here's to a flaming hot foreclosure market with the help of Dwan. Cheers. Hey everybody, welcome to another exciting episode of the most wonderful real estate podcast ever. So today is Thursday, so we're doing Inside the Minds of Today's Millionaires, and oh my gosh, look at these cutie pies. Mm-hmm. They're all brothers. They are so stinking cute. So I cannot wait to find out what Kenneth and Jeffrey and Kerwin have to say to us today. So uh, if you're new to Wonderful, our motto here is people before profits. So if that resonates with you, then this is the right place. And I am a real estate investor. I interview people mostly in real estate, but all sorts of entrepreneurs because let's face it, we can all learn something from everybody. So the more interesting the the people I interview, then the more fun it is for you and for me as well. So today I want to welcome you guys. I have Kenneth and Jeffrey and Kerwin. Yay. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Welcome to the show today. Thanks for having us. This is Kerwin. Oh my God. You guys are so adorable. All three of you, you're so adorable. Too bad all my daughters are already married off. I would totally fix you up. <laughs> you're probably like, no, we're too young. <laughs> so we uh, we start off with drinks with Duan. And so we're all having water. Look at all of us being so healthy. So you guys, cheers. 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 I was not classy enough to get a cup, so I just brought my bottle. Welcome to the show. Yeah. And uh, so we just kind of want to have a chat and, you know, want people to feel like they're just listening into us having a conversation. That's okay. kind of the gist of it. And and the oh. loyal listeners, they love that. So I just yeah. tell everyone, like, take a deep breath and just like ah, shake off whatever you got going on and get ready to have some fun. There you go. And just <laughs> want everyone to have fun and just be lighthearted. And uh, so what I want you all to do first is tell us who you are right now, how we get a hold of you right now. And then we're going to kind of backtrack a little bit. So basically we want to know what's your deal. Yeah, so we're the Donis brothers. My name's Kerwin. Yeah. My name's Jeffrey Donis. Uh, I'm 19 years old. Yeah. My name is Kenneth Donis uh, and I'm 23 years old and we're the Donis brothers. Yeah, yeah. And I'm also 19 years old and you can find us on uh, pretty much any social media platform at Donis brothers. That's D O N I S brothers and we also have a podcast called the real estate monopoly podcast where we interview real estate investors and other entrepreneurs and we share their stories and hope to inspire our audience and also educate them on all things real estate and entrepreneurship yeah and what we do is uh we invest in apartment complexes Uh, we help passive investors invest uh, alongside us as well okay so let me just get this straight so you're 19 and 23 and you're already investing in apartment complexes yes (laughs) It's like I raised you myself. <laughs> I know I had my kids buying rentals and doing stuff when they were in their teens. It's like, yeah. so, so let's just address the fact that you're so young. Yeah. Yes. So let's just say there's a real estate investor out there that's, I don't know, 62. And they think they know everything because they've been investing for a long time. How did you guys get started at such a young age? Yeah, well, um, it kind of goes back to me being I was in college sitting on my bed um, in my apartment and I was watching the breakfast club and I saw this guy come on and he started speaking about wholesaling real estate and how he you know came from a very um, very poor background Uh no money no credit um, he had no education and he was able to build a multi-million dollar business and so that really caught my attention because I was studying at the time, but I, you know, come from a single mother, uh, low income background and, you know, me thinking, you know, I didn't have cash or really much credit at the time. And so it was something that we could potentially get into. And that's what kind of sparked everything. So yeah, how old were you, Kenneth? Um, I was 20 at the time, but 20. about okay. 21, but yeah, 20. 
So just think about this for a minute. When the breakfast breakfast club first came out, I was actually that age of all the people in the movie. <laughs> that was a coming of age movie for my generation. So all those people, I was right there. I was I was that age. I was like, oh, look at you watching the breakfast club like a hundred years later. It's still a really good movie though, right? Yeah. It was a, it's a YouTube like yeah. <laughs> It's, I think, uh, well, I mean, it's the Breakfast Club. It's like a, um, I think it's like a, more of a radio station. It's like I a know. podcast. Yeah, it's like you a podcast. You're watching the, the, uh, the Breakfast Club. <laughs> 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 you weren't watching the Breakfast Club movie? Probably the main, the God. That I oh, I my God. The See, right Club there. Movie. That's the difference between 20 and 60. <laughs> 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 I thought you were watching the movie. Okay, you need to watch the movie, The Breakfast Club. I've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah, I, I was like, all right, you guys saw it. You know it. You're listening to a podcast. Oh my God, see right there. That's the difference. I did not know The Breakfast Club was a podcast because ah, all the kids in college do watch that movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, after that podcast, <laughs> we, we oh, also- that's hilarious. I'm sorry, I was going to say, well, we also read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I read that the freshman, uh, the summer leading up to my freshman year of college, I read that book. And I always say that that's the book that broke me. Um, before then, we were really focused on getting a good college degree, getting a nine to five job and, um, you know, pursuing that. And once we read that book, we learned that we took okay to work for skills and not work for money. Um, and also to learn how to invest in hard assets um, and really just pursue an entrepreneurial path. So, um, so Jeffrey, you guys were all three going to college, basically. What were you three looking to get degrees in? Like, what were you going to, nine to five, what were you going to go to nine to five? Yeah, so um, I was actually in college. I was a kinesiology major, and I wanted to be a physician assistant. So okay. um, pretty much go into the medical field just because I always kind of had a calling to help people and also um it you know i saw that it made some some money so i was you know attracted to that yeah and jeffrey what about you yeah so i ended up only going for a year so i was just taking gen eds but i had my mind set on something in business uh, i was thinking marketing specifically but i, I really didn't have something set right because i didn't just wasn't there long enough to actually start taking those specific classes nice and Corwin. yeah i was kind of all over the place i started out a uh, poli sci major political science um, i was always interested in politics and then I ended up getting to the business school. So I was going to do that. Um, and I was in college for two years, so a little longer than my brothers. But then I dropped out as well. And yeah, I started doing real estate full time. But I, I was on the track to go to law school. Wow. Look at you guys all really smart, too. Um, so now with your mom, so you said you were raised from a, did you say like a, um, a single mom? Yeah. Yeah. And a more uh, a poor mm -hmm. type of a background? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Low income. Um, Low income. Okay. So I also, uh, when I started off as a real estate investor, I was a single mom. So being a single mom is what catapulted me to actually start real estate investing. So where yeah. were you boys, where were you all raised? We were born in Queens, New York, but uh, we're, we live now in Durham, North Carolina. This is where we were raised. Oh, yeah. nice. North Carolina is nice. Yeah. yeah. Our mom was born in Guatemala um, and she came here when she was 18. She migrated here. And um, so, yeah, we got, she went to New York and that's where we were born. Cause you guys are like, you're like that true, you, you know, born in like Guatemala in America. And now you're like entrepreneurs. Like that is, that is actually the American dream. Absolutely. I agree. But I yeah. feel like a lot of Americans don't appreciate the fact of what we have just by the fact that we're born here. Absolutely. And it's funny you say that because um, the first time we went to Guatemala, it was um, in, in right leading into the new year of 2020. We were there for New Year's and Christmas. And um, that was the first time going back because my mom had gotten legal residency here. Mm -hmm. And um, we were just really humbled to see the conditions they lived in. Um, they were they were very humble, but they do have, um, you know, conditions that aren't the same as America. And I always like to say we won the lottery by being born here. And we were one generation away from extreme poverty. Um, yep. And so we, as soon as we went there, I mean, we were in an analysis paralysis before because we had learned about real estate, but we hadn't taken action. And once we saw the reality of, of how close we were to that kind of life, um, we realized that we didn't have time to waste and we couldn't keep making excuses about, you know, just right now, now is not the right time or anything like that. And so we just got back and, and took action and started our real estate journey. Your mother must be so proud of you guys. Yeah, she is now. <laughs> well, I'm sure I can imagine the conversation. Okay, mom, listen, I know you came from Guatemala. I know we're in America. I know we're all in college, 
and we're going to get degrees and work these jobs, which would be your mother's biggest dream for you yeah. to yeah. have raised in America, have a college degree, be all these great things. I can only imagine how the conversation went when you said, uh, so we're just going to be real estate investors. <laughs> how did, how yeah, did no. that work out? Yeah. Um, honestly, when I had first told her, um, you know, that I was dropping out and, and we're going to do this, we hadn't made any money at all. Um, we were, we were very close to closing on a few deals. Uh, and when I had told her, you know, she was very upset because like you said, it's her dream yeah. came here to further our, um, opportunities and from her viewpoint and most people in general, uh, their viewpoint in, in being successful is, going to college, getting a good degree, and then getting a nine to five job. But, yep. you know, we have seen from reading the books at this point that we had learned, like my brother said, rich dad, poor dad, was that is not always the case. No. Um, so, you know, we just took upon that journey. It was, it was hard, you know, she was very upset, but, um, you know, now she's okay after she's, you know, seen what we've been able to accomplish. Well, so you're clearly making money. <laughs> I mean, yeah. your podcast is a real, real estate monopoly. So, nothing else you're you're doing a lot of things right here so now she must be like oh my boys look at them doing so great yes. yeah yeah we try do you have, other, do you have other siblings we have um, a sister she's a uh, she's older and and she works in the crime scene investigation um in our, in our local police department so she she went to college and she's happy with what she does and you know how old is she 27 oh, she's a CSI. 28 she's 28 a CSI. <laughs> i love csi stuff yeah, I mean, no. when I was back way back when in my day, they didn't have all the schooling for all the crazy crime scene stuff like they do today. It's like, yeah. oh man, yeah. I would totally do stuff like that. Okay, yeah. so Jeffrey, I'm sorry, you were saying getting ready to say something. Yeah, um, so we both kind of dropped out in the same time, and uh, I was just talking like I hadn't made we hadn't made money yet in any real estate, but we were call cool calling, we were making calls, we were. Uh, she always heard us on the phone. She didn't really understand what we were doing. But we kept having to go back to her to take more money out so that we could pay for the business. But we hadn't made any money at that point. So she just kept seeing us spend money. And that was another thing that she didn't like. So eventually she was just like, this is the last time I'm going to get, let you guys take any money. <laughs> she had control of our savings account. Um, eventually, we ended up making a significant amount of money on the first deal. And at that point, that's when I decided I wasn't going back. And I, not, in a, not in like a negative way, but people call it a shut up check. Where like you can just show them something and say, you know, mom, like I wasn't just wasting my time kind of thing. So it just I was able to at least show her something physically that, that we were able to earn. And so I mean, how much was that first check, Jeffrey? Um, we closed two deals that day. It was uh thirty three thousand five hundred dollars was the total amount that we received on closing day. We closed one for five hundred and the other, I believe, for thirty three grand. So you made on your first deal. First two. After yeah. your mom is like, oh, you're in college, you get a job, you're in America, you do the American dream. Like, no, we're <laughs> going to work for ourselves. First check, hey, look at this check, mom. Look what we did. 33500 Yeah. That yeah. is a shut up check. We had held. How much uh, that did you give to mama? We give her, we try to give her 10% of everything we make. Yeah. So, right. so you guys give her 10% of everything you make. So you boys will be taking care of mom. Yeah, our big part of our why is to retire her as soon as possible. Oh. The first one, yeah. Now, I hate to even ask, how old's your mom? Uh, she just turned 51. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old enough to be your guys' grandma. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm 62. She's 51. Well, you know what? That's a good dream. I, I actually have a couple. Um, I, I have a few young people like you, young, and their whole job is they, they have other, come from other countries as well. And they say, we want to retire our mom because they're all raised by single moms. I've got uh, two kids I'm working with that are also weirdly twins, uh, African-American up in Atlanta. And they're mm, 27-ish or something. And they want to retire their mom. So they're working with me because that's what's saying. They're like, hey, our mom raised us by ourselves. And we, you know, they didn't have the best upbringing and um, they want to retire their mom. So I just, that is just really so honorable that you guys mm -hmm. want to do that. Because I'll be honest with you, a lot of American kids, I don't think they think that way. Yeah, that's. I, I see it as a blessing that we came up. Um, the, I mean, sure, we, everything, everyone faces adversity um, early on, and sh we might have faced our own sh share of hardships, but I think that's just made us who we are. So we're actually really grateful, and our mom yeah. provided us with enough. So we're happy yeah. with what, what, what the lot we got in life. Yeah, yeah no, no, I agree. I mean, my kids, so I, 
I had just one. I was a single mom. Then I got married. And so we have, you know, we had three and we just, we had cuts just so we raised them all together. So I took, we raised all of our kids. Like, listen, don't even waste your money going to college, be a real estate investor. It's a waste of money. You're going to end up like, you know, turn thousand dollars in debt. It's stupid. Don't do it. And, and people are like, well, you shouldn't raise your kids like that. I'm like, dude, neither of us went to college and we became millionaires like right out of the gate. Like, why would I want to send my kids to all that stuff? Unless they really want to do something. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But they all want to work for themselves and they all travel all the time, all over the world. My daughters have been to like a hundred and something countries and, <laughs> and they do real estate. And I was like, college is waste of time. Yeah. So again, yeah. all of you that go to college, just so you're listening, I'm not saying for every single person that college is a waste of time. We have doctors, attorneys, we have all kinds of people that need college. Yeah. But if you're going to college just to get a nine to five job, that's, it's a waste. Of, it's better off to do what you're doing. Do real estate work for yourself and make your own way in life. I mean, I, I 100% agree with what you guys are doing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. And I mean, it's not been easy. It's definitely like, I feel like a lot of people might think that uh, once you get to the top, that's really what a lot of people on social media will post about is like the glamorous stuff. But uh, we've learned to just fall in love with the journey. It's kind of, you know, obviously every day comes with its own adversity. Like Kerwin said, throughout our whole lives, it's been that way. But um, I wouldn't trade it for anything else because now these things, these challenges, they seem a lot easier than what we had to go through. Not to say we had a bad life, but um, everything just seems like a challenge. And we know that as soon as you go down, you have to come back up sometime. Well, you know, when you're up at the top of the mound, everyone's like, oh, look at the Jonas Brothers. They're so great. They're my friend. And then when you're down here, the little, they're like, oh, those boys, they, were, they didn't know what they were doing anyway. So, yeah, you know, until you have a few haters, you're not successful anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you can't, you, and you, you know, you are going to have ups and downs. I mean, I mean, no matter what. I've always been very blessed since I started in real estate to make money the whole time. But I've had a couple of deals that were, that ended up being just like skin on my teeth that I make a dollar deals, you know, and just so, so bad, like so many bad things, which is why I always tell people, you know, listen to my podcast, listen, you get on and listen to people and take the mistakes they made and don't repeat those. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So what is your, what is your main niche? Like, how did you guys decide, okay, we're, <laughs> We're so young and we're going to be real estate investors and we're going to be, we're going to be great. And we're going to be amazing. What was your first, were you going to wholesale? Were you going to rehab? Were you always into buildings? Like where did your, where did your mind start as what you were going to initially do? Yeah. So like Kenneth said, uh, we started watching uh, wholesaling videos online. That's how we got into real estate was just trying to make some cash. And we were able to get into our first deal that we made a, a pretty good amount on. So immediately we invested in, we had, we'd already been listening to other videos on creative financing. So structuring seller financing deals, uh, we did one subject to, we ended up getting two rentals that way uh, with zero money down, zero interest. And we were cash flowing from day one and we lease option both in the back end. So we were now have two cash flowing properties. Eventually we ended up trying to scale that wholesaling business, but it was very transactional. So throughout that first year, we did about 13 wholesale deals. I think we, in 13 months, we ended up doing like 15. Um, and then you we did 13 it. though in your first year out of the gate. Well, well, we cold called for six months, no deal, got yeah. our first deal after six months. So within a span of the last six months, we got 13 and we did a flip and we got a few rentals, but yes. we, we at this point, COVID had hit. So we were all cold calling from nine to yeah. eight. And then yeah. It was nonstop all day. So we were building a really big pipeline following up. Um, we had, we were just really just trying to make money at that point. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, uh, we, we love this self-education was something that we're very big on. So we kept hearing people say multifamily is where you want to go. And we were like, okay, cool. This is probably where we want to end up. But we all just sat down one day and was like, we're like, why not just go for it right now? Like what's stopping us? We yeah. realized self-limiting beliefs. And we, yes. like we did the first time when we dropped out of school, we said, let's just go for it. And then uh, that's, that's <laughs> what we did. So we had yeah. an hour doing, Kerwin can kind of catch up here. Yeah, I was just gonna say um, we asked one of our one of our friends and mentors. Um, we always knew we multifamily was the end goal for us, and we asked him, should we wait and build up this wholesaling business, or should we just get into multifamily? And what he said to me, us was, uh, take the straight path to where you want to go. And so where where is it you want to go, and just do it. And so we knew that multifamily was that, and and we didn't want to climb up the wrong the wrong tree. We yeah. wanted to take all the time because time is the most valuable thing we any any of us have. And so if we're going to put in time to build something and the end goal was always passive income at a large scale as fast as possible and multifamily, big multifamily was always the end goal. And we didn't want fear to be the reason that we didn't do that. You guys have overcome, like I, I have, I have over 500,000 students 
the biggest thing I can't get people is they're afraid and they have all these self-limiting. I, I need to record everything you guys say and say, listen, listen to these boys right here. 23, 19, listen to what they're saying right here. Because you guys have like stepped over all the hurdles. But you know, I think I, I, so I have had a lot of people that started working with me when they were teenagers. I might know sometimes when you're younger, you don't have as many self-limiting beliefs because you haven't been out in the world enough to be smacked down over and over and over and over. So yeah. you don't have that like, like cold calling. Most people in their 30s or 40s, you can get them to cold call for nothing. Yeah. But if you've never done it, you don't know. You're like, oh, okay, I should cold call. But that's what they said to do. I'm going to do that. Like mm -hmm. I tell people to go door knocking. It's like, go knock on doors. People are so happy that you're there. Call yeah. people. Like, don't be afraid of doing those things like that. Absolutely. So you guys have already overcome mentally. I can just see you guys being like cajillionaires, having like <laughs> your own show, all your own stuff, training. Because <laughs> half the things that hold people back, you are already past that at your young age. Yeah, and I, I'll just like to add, um, I think a benefit is that we were never really in the rat race. Kenneth um, had a yeah. job and we each had a job, but we, went, we never really had like the best uh, top golden handcuffs of a high paying corporate job with benefits. Yeah. So in a way, I mean, we, we we got to our that path at an early point where we hadn't been framed or like, you know, conditioned. Exactly. To exactly. You had, when you weren't used to people saying like, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Why are you going to quit your job? Why are you going to quit your security? You can't do that. And and, but the problem is that I, I feel like for newer investors, one of the biggest issues, it's the naysayers. It's the people that love you, but mm -hmm. say, you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, you guys are from Guatemala. How are you going to do that? And then all these reasons why you can't. And that does hold probably 75% of the people down from taking that first step because they listened to it or they've already tried and didn't make it and they went back to safety. And you guys are just like, we're young. We're just going for it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I wish would, everyone thought like you guys. I, I would say, though, I mean, I think it comes from the mindset. And I think where we learned that from is reading. And, yeah. uh, you know, me going through high school and college, I, I hated reading. You know, I didn't find what I was reading very valuable in my life. But then I started reading these mindset books like Napoleon Hill and like Grant Cardone and like books that are just motivational and literally the secret, you know, to, the secret yeah. to be successful in life. And that's when we realized, you know, literally anything that we, we, we can imagine and then put set goals to, to and then action behind, we can accomplish, especially yeah. if someone's already done it. Because we're yes. all, if it's humanly possible, it's already been done, it's already been proven, meaning that anybody can do it. So yeah, and no reinventing of the wheel. I tell people all the time, stop trying to reinvent the wheel. This is how you wholesale this type by multi family. Just learn from someone that did it and then just do it and cut your learning curve. Absolutely. And we also had our naysayers. I mean, a lot of people's, uh, or a lot of friends were saying you shouldn't drop out. Yeah. A lot of people's <laughs> parents were saying, you guys aren't doing this the right way. You should go get your license before this. This sounds really sketchy and stuff like that. But a uh, Dale Carnegie quote that I always mention is, uh, or I, I'm going to butcher it, but I wouldn't, don't trade places with someone that you, uh, or be careful who you take advice from and make sure that you trade places with them if you take their advice. Yep. And a lot of these people had never started their business. And if they did, then, I mean, they hadn't, it wasn't successful. So that's what I, I really learned from a really early, as soon as I read my first book, that was like the second book I read, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah. And I applied it immediately to every single naysayer that said something I would consider, you know, can I take this person's advice on the topic that they're giving me advice on? For example, yep. my mom has started a business. That's why I can't necessarily take her advice on that. But I think my mom is a really good mother. So if she wants to you know, coach me or mentor me to be a mother, then I'll take her advice on that. So I, I, no, I don't and, you know, yeah. it's funny. My son, my son is 30 now. He has four kids married. I got four little grandbabies. But when <laughs> my son was young, like 17, 18, he was always reading um, Napoleon Hill and Dale Carnegie. And that boy, he just quotes. He quotes <laughs> stuff out. I'm always like, are you 80? Like, how do you talk so mature? But that's the biggest thing. It's like, you have all these people that give you advice. If you look at them and go, hey, they're making 20 bucks an hour and they hate their job, why do you want to take advice from someone that isn't doesn't doesn't even have the balls to do what you did? And do you want to live in their shoes? Absolutely. And something else that um, we've learned is that failure is only possible if you quit. 
I mean, I know that sounds cliche, but it's true. I mean, if you don't give up, then then you can't fail. It's just a matter of time. Um, and another thing, a re reason that we got into real estate is we we learned and we did our research. I mean, a lot of people that they make a lot of money from their salary job and they mm -hmm. make their, their money from their, their income, their active income, but a lot of them make their long-term generational wealth from real estate. Yep. And we realized like people, a lot of times wait till they're about to retire towards the end of their life and their careers to get into real estate. We just wanted to do it the other way around and yep. start in real estate first so that we can live yep. a life of freedom, a life by design. And I mean, yeah, we haven't looked back. You guys mount my soul. Oh my God, I love you three. Oh, I do. So tell me when you say you get to multifamily, give me an example of what you, what do you mean by multifamily? Yeah, so um, we do, we target 80 to 100 unit uh, properties. 80 to 100 no, units, okay. 80 to 200, I'm sorry. Kenneth does acquisitions. He can talk more about that. I do investor relations and uh, strategic partnering. Um, capital raising is what I mean by investor relations on the back end, right? You're just going to nurture the relationship when they invest. But um, when it comes to strategic partnering, I'm very intentional with people oh. that I meet at a business event. So I will we'll fly out to a real estate event. I'll get their business card and then I just network. And then Kerwin does all the marketing. Um, but they can kind of tell you about what they do in regards to the business. Yeah. So basically what, what we do as a whole is called apartment syndication. And we'll basically, and just in a nutshell, what we do is um, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, find a deal that makes sense and meet investors returns. We'll raise the equity for this apartment and we'll go out and buy it. And then pretty much provide our investors that invest with us, uh, a, a percentage return on their investment. So, uh, we just buy apartments basically. Are you like 80 to hundred units? To 80 to 200. Yes. 80 to 200. Okay. That is, uh, I mean, that's a big, that's a, that's a big place to start. Yeah, it's very Most people competitive. start with like a little four ply. I mean, on my first one, I did a duplex. I was like, oh, I got a duplex. And you know, then I bought like a commercial. Oh, I got a commercial building. I, <laughs> I, well, you know, also 30 years ago, there was no internet. There were no RIA groups. There was yeah. no training. There was like, it was really seat of your pants. So I don't think back then it would even have occurred to me because I didn't know anyone that even did that or had ever heard of that until later. But we do buildings that we buy. Uh, we, we bought a town. So wow. we're rehabbing a whole town. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can you can you can you expand on that, or we can just talk about that later? But that's right, yeah. When you guys interview me, I'll tell you about my little town, <laughs> and I'll invite you to come out to my town and okay, come cool. as my guests and hang out. And I'll oh uh, yeah, it's so funny because we bought all these buildings. All of a sudden, the mayor is calling, all the people are calling. Hey, we want to meet. We want to take you guys to dinner. It's like I've known us for twenty years. You ever said two words to us? Oh, now you want to like. Now we're everybody's best friends. Because <laughs> you own their property. <laughs> we do. We actually bought one building. And I don't even know. The woman that was renting in that building, for some reason, she didn't like my husband. Like, they knew each other from high school. So yeah. the day she found out that we bought the building, she said, I will never pay rent to Bill Twyford. And she literally, over the weekend, packed up her entire store and moved out. Oh man! I was like, "What did you do in high school?" He goes, "Nothing." I liked everyone. Like he literally, my husband was like that crazy, like the class clown guy. And for some reason, she had some. I said, "She probably had a crush on you in high school," <laughs> and you didn't reciprocate. So now she's not gonna, you know, give you any rent. And she was like, moved out like a midnight move. It's like, are you seriously kidding me right now? <laughs> so high school never goes away, even when you're older. Um, so how many buildings have you all bought? So we're under contract. been a part of. Yeah, yeah we're uh, we got it under contract on one. We'll close on it in September twentieth. That'll be the first uh, multifamily. Okay. And we're looking to do two more, hopefully soon. Kenneth just submitted an LOI on a property in Alabama that he can probably touch on more. Um, but our group, we're a part of a group called Think Multifamily. It's like a mastermind group out of Dallas. A lot of people in that group will find deals, and we'll partner up with just bringing on our investors, and also just kind of helping with any aspect of the deal that we can. Can yeah. I ask who runs that group? Uh, oh. Mark Kenny and Tamil Kenny and then uh, Brent Kawakami, I believe um, he helps yeah. out as well. Okay. I've got two people after we're done talking. I'm going to two people I'm going to hook you guys up with that are multifamily. Oh, that, yes. uh, would probably really love to work with you. Um, so when you guys were young, when you were like, you know, I mean, you're young now, but when you were like young, like 12, 13, what were you guys doing? Were you like playing soccer? Were you working? Yeah. Like, what were you doing? Oh, good guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was like, I wanted to play college soccer. That, that was my goal growing up. I wanted to go pro, but um, I don't know. I guess I just got into other things in high school towards the end. And it just, eventually I was just not as interested to go play anymore. Um, I guess like social life and stuff kind of started taking more of my time. And eventually I, I had the opportunity to go play at a private school, um, walk on, nice. but it was very expensive. So 
my mom offered to pay and I was like, mom, you're not going to pay for it. Like she wanted to take out a whole loan on it. And I was like, it's not that important. Like I'll, yeah. I'll just, um, but so yeah. you guys are just like good kids, like being good, paying attention to mom, not doing drugs. Yeah, no, exactly. So, I mean, we, you know, I mean, you know, I think my mom did a very good job of raising us, honestly. Really did. She's low income, um, you know, and one thing I really admire about her is that we always saw her struggling, but although we saw her struggling, you know, we, we never saw her quit. And I, I think that's kind of where we, we get the grit from is that yeah. like, you know, there's, I would say I wouldn't quit on anything that I really, really want and desire. So, yeah. you know, that, that's kind of where I learned it from, I'd say. Yeah. But, and um, our mom cleans houses. So it's not like she's doing yeah. something that's easy. I, I've done it before. I mean, I clean my own house and I hate doing it. Yeah. It's hard. So she does it all day. And it is really hard. I have housekeepers. I'm telling you, I would not want to clean my house because I have yeah. 7,000 square foot house on the mountains. And like everything is wood and it's like dusting this house is a nightmare. It's like a two day job. <laughs> that's a stupid house. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. And that's why we're so motivated to, uh, to really just be able to replace her income with something with our, with, you know, passive income. So that way she doesn't have to work anymore and she can at least go do something else. Cause her whole life really up until this point, um, when she moved here was to kind of provide for us. So we kind of want to just give her some type of freedom to go do what she actually wants. I tell you, she really sounds like, I love your mom. I don't know her, but I love her already because you guys are like good boys and you have good morals and your, your, uh, your values and your are pure, like your heart is pure, what you want to do and taking care of your mom and working on all these deals like that. Like, there's just not a lot. And it's not even that you're from another country, even any kids around anywhere. There's just not, everyone's all into their games and they're just like, you know, there's just not a lot of young kids that are business minded yet. Yeah. And it's really refreshing to see it because I, one of the things, whenever we do a, a workshop, we tell everybody, if you have teenagers, bring your teenage kids for free because we'll teach them how. And we had one kid, Timothy, and he was only 16 years old. He started working with us. He made $200,000 his first year. His wow. mom had to sign his contract and he paid his way through college. He helped pay off his mother's house. His dad had passed away. He had bought a car, like all this stuff. And he started at 16. I was like, oh my God, what I would give to have like just thousands of 16 year old kids with an open mind. Yeah. They would do what you tell them to do because it would be life changing. 100%. Honestly, I, I mean, like, I always think, like, could I have done this in high school? I'm like, yeah. But then what I've wanted to, I feel like we got a lot of things that we were able to just experience in high school. And just, I was playing soccer, so I can't say I'd go back. But it's awesome to hear that you're working with other kids. Um, a lot of people our age, like you said, are not. They're focused on other things, which is fine. I think a lot of people come from different kinds of backgrounds. So yeah. maybe they have less of a determination or uh, maybe like different goals than we do. I guess we just- Yeah, they do. I mean, I grew up really, like really in the country country. Like everybody had 10, 20 acres. Everybody had farms and cows and chickens. And like, and it was the seventies and we didn't have anything to do. So we like smoked weed all day. <laughs> <laughs> like, there was nothing. We didn't even have a traffic light. We didn't have, there was no McDonald's. There was nothing. We had nothing to do. So- <laughs> So we literally just went and played in the river and smoked pot all the time. <laughs> so I'm like, thank God I got out of West Mountain and moved to Florida and saw like a bigger picture and a kind of a bigger city life. It's like, oh my Lord, everybody said my whole high school years is being stupid. So <laughs> <laughs> at least you enjoyed them, I guess. Yeah, so. at least you had fun. I guess. I don't know. I think I did. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know. I, I don't even know. Like nowadays, it's like, oh my God, I wouldn't do any of the stuff I did back then ever never again in my life so um <laughs> it's crazy so then how long have you guys been investing actually like okay we flipped our first house how much time has passed we got into it January of 2020 so yeah. uh almost two years it's it's like a shy of a few months but yeah it was so since then you you've got a send you got a multi-family you flipped 13 houses wholesale wholesale, wholesale. wholesale. Yeah. yeah and what have you done anything else um, we're, well, currently, I mean, I'm, I'm doing acquisitions with a single family residence, residential company. So I just structure creative finance deals. Um, I wholesale some and pretty much is doing whatever I can. And that's the active income we're going to use to get into our multifamily business. But we have, like I said, we have two more deals coming up that I'm hoping to be a part of, um, nice. with, um so with wholesaling 13 deals that has given you guys enough money that you don't have to actually work. You can, you're able to do this full time. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, I kind of was going back to the, uh, I guess, acquisitions role because I wanted to just bring in more money. But yeah, the, we, we obviously made some profit from that business and it's helped us a lot. 
Yeah, we're, we've been able to pay for our education. I mean, we're a part of the thing multifamily group. It's been a great group. Uh, I mean, you know, they let us young people in and, uh, you know, everyone in the group has been very welcoming. And I mean, getting in on a 138 unit at, at our age, I think is, uh, you know, awesome. And, and the fact that they've it's astounding. Oh, yeah, I've been they, investing for I've been for 30 years and teaching for 25. I know like every speaker in the country, it's astounding what you guys <laughs> are doing at your age. And it's just it's like honestly, I I'm not even your mom and I'm so proud of you guys. <laughs> well yeah, I mean we're I mean, yes, yeah, so you know, our first goal is to um, you know, retire our mom, like I said, but I think that that's kind of one of our small whys. Mm -hmm. I think we for some reason, we, we have like a calling to try to help as many people as we can, not just inspire because, you know, we come from, I wouldn't say nothing, but we come from very, very uh, humble beginnings. You do. If we can do it, you know, anyone can do it for sure. And yep. that's kind of what we're documenting our journey. But, um, you know, I personally, I mean, we, my brothers read a, a book um, and they can kind of go into this, but we kind of want to give back and build libraries and kind of partner with Room to Read. Um, they can touch on that. Yeah, it's just well. a book by John Wood. Um, it's called Leaving Microsoft to Change the World. And he just talks, he was like a highly paid executive at Microsoft. Um, and he just was not fulfilled. He was making a lot of money, but he just ended up kind of breaking up with his girlfriend. He went to Nepal and saw how much, you know, how happy the kids were, but how little they had. So uh -huh. he kind of wanted to help them. I think he gave them like three books that he had and they really, really loved it. So he tried to just start donating as many books as he could. And that led to him starting a nonprofit. Um, it's one of the biggest nonprofits now, but uh, our mom is from Guatemala. So when we went there actually in person for the first time last year, uh, we just realized how, how like insanely uh, ungrateful we were just being here. We, like Kenneth, we'll all talk about how much adversity we have. We're low income, but it's like nothing compared to what it is over there. It's night oh, and I know. day. Uh, I, I'm wearing this shirt over here. And I, I think like if I were to wear this over there, I would stand out like a, like a sore thumb because this is a nice shirt compared to what they have over there. Because so when we went over there, uh, they had a lot of our family members were wearing shirts that I had outgrown or my mom had just taken from our dressers or our closets and sent over in these big boxes that, you know, as a girl, as a kid, I was like, where is she sending these boxes to? And I was walking around and like everyone, my uncles, my aunts were wearing my like old soccer jerseys. Wearing your things. Yeah. And, and things that I just had forgot about. And, and not taken just, for granted. Yeah. But it was like, a, that's a metaphor. And I saw it, I was like, wow. Like, hands down, I mean, I, I was holding a phone, I was wearing nice shoes, and it was just like, literally, it just humbled us so much. So immediately when we got back, that's kind of what pushed us to like, make the most of our resources, because we literally are blessed to be here. Mm -hmm. You so, are yeah. so blessed. Yeah, I gotta tell you something. I, I went on a, a missions trip, you know what a missions trip is, right? Yeah. So yeah. I went on a missions trip, I don't even know, decades ago, over, um, gosh, I can't think of the name of the city, but it was in Mexico. And it was, uh, I think they call them colonias, where people just take like a spot of land and they start building houses like out of pallets and they all live there. Mm -hmm. And I had never actually, and I had already been in America, of course, you know, raising a farm in the country, like, you know, feeling like, oh, I'm raising, you know, raising middle of nowhere, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you what, I went over there and I stayed for a month and I, I bawled my eyes out every single solitary day. I could not believe how everybody lives and they were, and they were happy and the people would like cook food for us. And, oh my yeah. God, they were so grateful. And I tell you what, I came back. I was so, I, I was so different. And I thought, wow, because I can't imagine and being, you know, even though I was raised in the country and, you know, I feel, like, Ooh, but actually being raised like that, it was so shocking to me. And the people, like you said, they were happy and they were great and the kids were playing and everyone loved us. And I learned a little Spanish and like, it yeah. was the most, it was the most amazing thing But I really truly didn't realize that people live at that poverty yeah. level, because even though you see it and you hear it and, you know, there's all these sad commercials with the sad music until you go and live there like that for a minute, you really have no idea. And so yeah, and, and, like immediately got me working with uh, homeless and uh, battered women, like all kinds of stuff. And I've been doing it ever since because I was so taken back by the stark, the stark reality of the difference of there versus here. And even the people here that are poor, they're still not poor like that. Yeah, hundred percent. Okay. And even, I mean, you know, that is, is, you know, just seeing it is like crazy, but then us realizing, or at least, you know, just being there that being our family like we're actually yeah. related like these are our aunts yeah. our cousins like my my mom's Sister. sisters and brothers and our like our family like our blood family so yeah. we were 
like, you know, this, this is not going to be like this forever. Like we're going to change this is basically the mentality. Well, we have. It was literally like, like everyone says, winning the lottery. Like my mom was one of the only one of her relatives to come over here. Um, and I mean, she talked about these people growing up, but I'd never actually met them. So it yeah. was like, mom, you're mentioning these people. I don't really know them, but when you actually get to meet them and you get to see like where they live, they lived in like a, it was like a little community, but it was more so of a village. The, the water yeah. was clean. Uh, the, there was like hardly any drinking water. I would say like there was always, but it just seemed so like different. It was very different. And obviously being there, I was like, oh my God, like insanely blessed to be here. When I got back, I, you're right. Like you said, you come back and it's like, oh my God, like I took everything for granted. So it, I think it was like the mind shift that happened there. We were reading a lot there because we didn't have Wi-Fi. So that's another thing, right? Like you don't have Wi-Fi and like we took that for granted too, you know? Yeah. So all these things that you just start realizing um, we were able really to use it as something that was a, a growth thing. And when we got back, we just took initiative and started yeah. you know, wasting any more time. I and agree. I would say that, that was the catalyst for everything that we've done and everything we want to accomplish. Uh, yeah, that, that was the event that changed our lives. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you guys read the Bible, but in the Bible, it talks about uh, generational wealth. And like right. one of the blessings is to be the person in your family that breaks the back of like poverty and starts to create generational wealth. So it seems to me like you three are are the people in your family that are going to like start the generational wealth. Yeah, yeah I, would say, I would say, I mean, because we're after, we, I would say we have very audacious goals. Um, I mean, we're after like, I wouldn't say the money, but we're, I want to help a lot of people. And whether that's, I want to do a big development project, hopefully in, in Guatemala, maybe in, in uh -huh. if the village that my mom's from is not already developed, you know, bring clean water to thousands of yes. people. I want to just spread the knowledge with room to read and then any other way that we can help people as well. But the more money that you generate, the more that you can give. You can so help. Exactly. Yeah. So people are like, oh, it should be about the money. I'm like, hey, listen, if you make $10 million a year and this guy makes $100,000 a year and you want to give 80% of it away, look how much money, I mean, unless you're like, you know, snorting coke or gambling or something stupid. <laughs> if you yeah. want to help people, you can help so many more people with money. So uh -huh. I always think like, hey, I am blessed and I'm happy that I've got a lot of money because I help, I can't help the people I help if I don't have the money. Absolutely. Exactly. And, you know, and, and when you have a good giving heart, not everybody's like that. You'll, as you'll find out, as you go through your real estate career, you'll find a lot of really super greedy people that don't care anything about people. Yeah. No, and yeah. I'm sure you've met a few already, but you'll meet more as you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, obviously, like, we want to provide our, 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 our future generations. But like Kenneth kind of said, it's just, um, I was realizing that a lot of people, I, I, see, I see myself getting so much fulfillment from what I'm doing. Yeah. And I see other people that, it may not be, but I don't know. I just, it seems like I love this so much. I need to show other people kind of thing. Um, I just, a lot of people my age, they might not think this is a possibility because I didn't at one point and I read one book and it led me down a rabbit hole. So yep. I really help other people just see some other options. Cause it's not growing, going into school. It really just seems like there's only one way to go and, and do anything in life, which is get a job, get a nine to five, get really good grades. So you can get that job, um, you know, do all these extracurricular activities uh, join internships and build your resume so that you can get a really uh -huh. nice job and then work your way up the corporate ladder a lot of that's how they groomed us and that yeah of it's, course yeah it's not no one's fault i don't know who's to blame but i think it's a little unfair because i don't know if it's i think i don't think it was a coincidence i think this is what i was meant to do but i think a lot of people they could do this as well they just don't know it's a possibility they might be afraid for whatever reason or they're, they're scared for whatever people think, like and you, you know the thing is it's it's also generational like when i graduated high school in 77 was living in Ohio. So Ohio and Michigan were the big states for the car companies that built all the cars. So I was told through all of high school, you get out of high school, you get married, you get a job at a factory and you have kids and you work until you're 60 and then you retire. And that was my parents doing better for me than you know every generation does better. But nobody back then was like, oh, you're a girl, you should go to school, you should get a degree. It's like, no, you should get married, have kids and work at a factory. And then and do your time with the man and then you should retire. And I was taught that my entire life. Yeah. And then when I realized uh, I did actually get a factory job. And after a week, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't do this. I won't make it. So let me ask each of you, because one of the reasons what something that you just uh, said, Jeffrey, was that you read a book. So one of the reasons I really love this session of Inside the Minds of Today's Millionaires is because sometimes a single thing that a person says someone else hears it and then they read or do or follow that same thing and it opens up their mind too. So I would like each of you 
Uh, and Kenneth, we'll start with you. What can you just name like one specific book that you read and you thought like, wow, this this book made me think different. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm a really big. But you can't all three name the same book. So think yeah. ahead. <laughs> I'm a really big uh, Napoleon Hill book. So okay. I would say Think and Grow Rich. And I, I know that a lot of entrepreneurs kind of say that, but it's really, really simple. At the same time, it's almost cliche, I guess you could say. But like I said earlier in the interview, um, you know, if you can think something or imagine something or if it's already been done, yeah. then it's possible. And with it just solely being already possible or even you imagining it, it means that it's possible. So then you figuring out setting goals and then setting action and then having backing that by burning desire to actually want to do whatever it yeah. is that you want to do you can accomplish literally anything. And, and anything. we've seen this time and time again, whether you want to be a lawyer, a dentist, astronaut, scientist, multimillionaire, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, I think that that book, it just kind of shows you exactly what you're trying oh, to no, do. I love it. That's the one my son, he quotes like, he's like a walking Napoleon Hill. Uh, Karen, <laughs> what was uh, one book that you can name that made you think different? Yeah, I would say uh, Fake by Robert Kiyosaki is my all-time favorite. Um, it discusses like just uh, it was really what broke me out of the the traditional mindset. Um, mm -hmm. it, it gives you the economic context of the history of like the, the, the dollar. Um, it also explains why there's fake teachers. So teachers that are teaching entrepreneurship but never been entrepreneurs. Oh. Um, why money isn't really what people think it is and why you need to invest in hard assets and why real estate is so powerful. So it, it, I think it touches on mindset. It touches on yeah. um, thinking outside the box and it also can empower you to start investing. Nice. Okay. Jeffrey. Yeah. So 10 X is a really good one, but the one I want to talk about is outwitting the devil. It's by Napoleon Hill as well. Um, that one <clears throat> kind of like kind of said, Napoleon Hill is really big on thoughts, but yes, understand yes. why you have certain thoughts or, or at least acknowledging that thoughts maybe may not be able to control all your thoughts, but you can at least, it's just really good. I think like it talks about where they come from negative and positive and how you can influence. And um, literally in my opinion, like everything starts from a thought, right? So if you're able to at least, educate yourself on why you think certain ways and how you can manipulate that you can literally do anything and that's kind of what Kenneth was touching on in thinking grow rich it all goes yeah. hand in hand but yeah I know it's hands down Napoleon Hill is probably my favorite author he's great and you know it's funny because I did not start real estate investing until I was 30 so 32 years ago I read uh the same think and grow rich I read the same kind of books I'm like wow okay I can do this why can I do I can do this you know what's stopping me from doing this and uh, it's just funny how those same books cycle through generations after generations after generations, and they're yeah. still always just as powerful. Yeah, they're timeless. Really. They are time. They are timeless. That is such a great quote. Okay, so let me just ask one, uh, just two random questions. Tell me, uh, what's your guys' favorite food? What do you like to eat? I love pizza. My favorite is <laughs> burger, specifically with bacon and pepper jack cheese. <laughs> I would say chicken, chicken tikka masala. I love tiki masala. Yes. What's your favorite food? <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know. I love Indian food a lot. I mean, we eat a lot, a lot, a lot of Indian food. I just, I don't know, a lot of it. I probably really unhealthy amount. I love it. It's just like. So and, um, I know you all are young, but do you have like a favorite band of all time at this young little juncture in your life? <laughs> we like to listen to like uh, R and B music. I would say so kind of like our generation um it may not be a, a lot of people like the are in real estate a lot tend to be a little older right so um they probably don't listen to the music we listen to it's kind of like pop like like justin bieber but i also like this rapper called little baby I, just, <laughs> I, I, I like it but i don't know if you have you heard of him uh i have not i uh sad, we sadly my husband every single day of our lives so he gets up and he we have serious so he puts on seven. I'm like, oh my God, please, the love of God, listen to something else. But when he's not in the house, I listen to blues. Oh, okay. I'm just like, I'm a blues girl. I just like that down and dirty, Stevie <laughs> Ray Vaughan blues guitar. It's just like, oh. <laughs> it just soothes my soul. <laughs> so I have heard of Justin Bieber, obviously. What was the other one that you said? Um, little, his, his name is pronounced, it's L-I-L -L, and then it's baby. He's a rapper. Yeah, <laughs> a I don't think I know. I, do, I like rap that. You know what? When hip hop first came out, I was just like, cause I was a disco girl and then like hip hop, I was like, oh my God, this is like the best music. I was so excited when hip hop first came out. Yeah. 
Kind of like, gotten, some of the rap is a little bit like, oh, no, a little bit too raunchy these days for my, my little sense of humor. <laughs> but some of that stuff, I'm just like, oh, my God. Seriously, how's that even on? Because <laughs> I can on the radio. When the first curse word, like the first curse word that ever was in a radio and a song was like in the 70s. I mean, mm -hmm. people were like picketing radio stations over all curse words. And then you hear like a song like WAP and you're like, oh my God, there are children that are listening to that song. That's the song I was thinking of when you, oh, you said God. that. Jeez, it's like, I wouldn't even let my children in their 30s listen to it. Of course, I know they all have because I did too because I, I was shocked that that's on the radio. <laughs> you jamming out to it? Oh my God. It's terrible, isn't it? Okay, uh, so let me ask you this. Um, so let's just kind of do a little review. I, tell you, I always take a lot of notes. And I kind of like to just do a little bit of a review at the end and, and see if we're able to get a little bit inside the minds of the Donis brothers. So we have uh, Kenneth and Jeffrey and Kerwin, so adorable. And uh, Kerwin and Jeffrey are twins, yes. yep. 19 yep. and uh, 23. You guys, your first check was 33,500 between two deals. That was your first check. Which was yeah. the like, mm hmm, here you go, show it to everybody. Yeah, yeah, okay, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And you guys come from a single mom, a lower income family, and you just went into college and kind of thought that path for us just for like a hot minute. And then you're like, mm, no, you know what, we're going to change course. And yeah. we read some Napoleon Hill, thinking of Grow Rich, some Napoleon Hill, Outweighing the Devil, uh, Kiyosaki, Fake. And then you got into different aspects of real estate that you like as far as. Uh, cold calling, doing some deals, acquisitions, different things, wholesale a few deals, have a couple subject twos, and you're going to focus your career on multifamilies. Yeah. And we like pizza, tiki masala, uh, burgers with the, the pepper jack cheese and the bacon. I like those too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, bacon and cheeseburger is like the best invention ever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and you uh, learned about, you uh, on a podcast, The Breakfast Club, I'm going to challenge you guys to actually watch the Breakfast Club movie. Yes. Okay. okay. Can you do that for me? Yes. Yeah. Seriously, it's a really good coming of age movie and you're the age of the movie and it's a really good coming of age movie and you'll you'll get the thing. It'll, it'll be good. And you guys are working on apartment syndication, which I love, and you want to build libraries and you just really want to give back. And you want to retire your mom. Yep. Is that yeah. kind of a nutshell of who the Donis yeah. brothers are? Absolutely. Yeah. Ugh. Perfect. I love you guys so much. So can I have you on in a year so we can see what you guys have done in a year from now? Yes, yeah, for sure. Love to come back on. I want to follow. I want to, I want my people to follow you guys and follow up with what you're doing because you are just like the prime example of, of people that, that realize the opportunities that are in front of you. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not, you know, and again, it sounds, sounds a little bit like I'm bashing American kids and I'm really not, but so many kids just grow up with, you know, $200 tennis shoes and they've got every toy in the world. Like I didn't give my kids all this. I was like, no, you want, you got to earn my, uh, my kids had to earn everything. I didn't give them anything. And mm. kids just don't realize like what they have in front of them or they listen to the excuses or they're afraid or they're really pushed into college, do this, do that. And everyone's in kind of a box. Yeah. And you guys jumped completely out and smashed that box. <laughs> and started a whole new thing. And I just love that about you. Like, I love that about you guys so much. Thank you. We, we see it as like being first generation Americans. We have a blank book that we get to write. Yeah, so you we're do. Writing our own story. I wish more kids in America would have that mindset. And I get why they don't. Because I mean, I, ha I have so many friends that gave their kids every little thing they ever wanted. And, you know, now I see 30 year old people that spend five hours a day gaming. It's like, seriously, like. <laughs> what is that like why why did you do that i didn't i just I, I raised my kids more like you guys were raised like you're gonna work hard you're gonna make a difference you're gonna do good things you're gonna volunteer as teenagers they were volunteering and working and they were giving back when they were young because mm -hmm. i just don't think people um i don't think people just realize the opportunities that are in front of them and a lot of it does come from your parenting yeah, yeah. so kudos to your mom she's like a plus we love your mother yeah, what is her first name? Elida. Say it again. Elida, E L I D A. And then last name Donis. So Elida, she is a rock star. She deserves a queen crown <laughs> for 
Absolutely. for raising such good boys here. All right, so at the end of, uh, so everyone, uh, also if you're brand new, you can go to dwonderful.com and opt in. I've got some free things for you. And what website do you want to give people for you? www.donis, that's D-O-N-I-S, investmentgroup.com. Dot com. Okay, I love it. www.investmentgroup.com. And uh, I have one a company called Benford Investment Group. So I like the investment group words. Yeah. So it works. And see, Benford is my name and my husband's name. So it's Benford. So you put it together, it's B I G. I'm a little things out there. And um, yeah. at the end of all the shows, I always uh, give out a, a life equity. I have something I call the five equities of life which are um, financial, spiritual, physical, mental, and family. And I feel like pretty much everything in our life falls under a category. Like friends can be under family, financial can be under giving as well as making, you know. And um, so I always like to give out an assignment at the end of every single show. And I ask the listeners to do whatever the assignment is just for one week. And if it adds value to their life for them to keep doing it. And if not, at least they did something different than their same old, same old. So I know you guys have uh, an equity and an assignment. So who Curran. who's going to give it? So Corwin, yeah. what is yeah. our equity and what is our assignment? Yeah. So I might have misunderstood the assignment, but I will let me know. That I will, we'll, we'll we'll adjust if needed. But um, it, I think we you know we all agree that you're the some of the people you surround yourself with. And so since we're real estate investors, I always encourage people to start learning as soon as possible. So if you go to eventbrite.com, that's E-V-E-N-T-B-R-I-T-E.com or meetup.com, um, you can find a local real estate event in your area. And I encourage people to print out some business cards and show up and network, go to at least one or two if you only have a week. I think people can realistically at least go to one. Um, try to meet as uh, three people, build, have great conversations with three people, give them your card, but also make sure you get their contact information and then follow up with them um, in a month and then follow up with them every month, build a relationship, try to create a symbiotic relationship where you're leading with value and try to see how they can bring you value as well. And try to see if you can learn as much as you can because real estate can truly change your life. I love it. So we're gonna put that under financial i would say financial and friends because ideally you know uh, networking is about building long-term authentic and symbiotic relationships so it truly is it's so good that you guys know that now but as you get into 30 40 50 60 you will realize that the people that you build these relationships with will be your best friends and you guys can do amazing things with your friends and i love that people can go to eventbrite they can get on meetup there's you know most of the rio groups in the country uh, are just starting to meet back in person most of them still meet online. So you, at this point, you can join RIA groups around the, the whole United States and be a part of 50 different, different RIA groups. And you need to surround yourself with like-minded people. Absolutely. And we always uh, believe that investing in relationships will have an infinite return on, on investment. So that's, you know, that's what we've always encouraged people to just go get out there and meet people. I love it. All right. So the last final thing is I just always like everyone to give like just a word or two, a parting word of wisdom. Yeah. I'll start. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Take, take action. That'll be my part. Okay, take action. See, I write all these down so I can read back over the notes. I love take action. Jeffrey? Uh, yeah, in my opinion, the key to success are your habits, your daily habits. And you said it's one word or just? One or two, just like a word of wisdom, like a parting word. It can be one or two words, just something that, you know, I don't want, I don't tell you ahead of time. I don't want you to have time to ponder it. I want to see what comes up here, what comes out. Yeah, persistence. Ooh. I think for all of those actions, persistence, taking, they're all, I agree, 100%. They're all amazing. And you know what? Really, one falls on the other. Like, if you make it a good habit to always be persistent and you're always taking action, it's like it all you kind of roll like the three rings in the background. Now, those three rings you have behind you, one could be <laughs> action, habits, and persistence. Yep. <laughs> I love that too. What does that symbolize? The three brothers? Yeah, and we're, we're giving. So this is our company logo, um, but yeah, we kind of designed it because of the giving hand and then the three brothers, the trio. So yeah, it's kind of how we came up with it. <laughs> it's amazing. You guys are so awesome. I'm just so in love with all of you. All right, everyone. Uh, so find these guys on Facebook and the website was www.donisinvestmentgroup.com and just really reach out to these guys. Uh, they and their podcast is called the Real Estate Monopoly, and y'all do know what you're talking about. I got to give you kudos for that. 
you really are very educated and well-spoken. You know what you're talking about as far as Thank real estate you. investing. You did not use any improper terms. <laughs> yeah, I'm so honored you guys were on my show today. Oh my God, I'm so excited to have you here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. My pleasure, seriously. So everyone, uh, remember, we'll be here uh, next week, same bat time, same bat channel. And remember, the truth is in the red letters. All right, everybody. Ciao. Thank you for dropping by to the most wonderful real estate podcast ever, making real estate investment wonderful each and every time. Oh, for more information on how to make your, your real estate, estate dreams, dreams a reality, reality, keep an eye on wonderful.com and be sure to become a member.